I intend to live forever or die trying. In, when I was born, I was born with a genetic challenge. And so members of my family had a thing called polycystic kidneys. And basically what that is, is a kidney that ends up having fluid-filled cysts and ultimately your kidney fails. You either go on dialysis or you get a kidney transplant. My grandfather uh, died at 40 years old from polycystic kidneys back in the 50s. So I go to Wild uh, Cornell Medicine, uh, New York Presbyterian Hospital, great bunch of doctors, and I, uh, in 2008, uh, get prepared for a kidney transplant. I got a special kind of transplant. It was called an ABO incompatible transplant. And it was amazing. It was amazing because what they basically could do is give me a transplant, an organ from somebody with a different blood type. Now, typically, going back 10 years before that, that was impossible, right? You would automatically get the transplant, you would reject the transplant, and that would be the end of it. But what they do, what they did for me is they, they removed the antibodies from my blood through a process called plasmapheresis, and then they just jammed in a bunch of immunoglobulin, and then they put you on a protocol once you're done with the transplant and you stay on this medicine. And that's amazing. That was amazing to me. Now, when you think about the first kidney transplant happening in 1954, that was the first transplant. And you think about the period right after that from 1996 to 2000 where they were able to not only do transplants, but do incompatible blood type transplants. And then my transplant in 2008, that's an amazing period of time where it went from my grandfather dying at 40 years old in the 50s to me being 10 years out in a transplant and having just like an awesome life. Feeling great, doing great, it's awesome. Today, they do almost no ABO-compatible transplants anymore. And the reason is they've gotten so advanced in the last 10 or 11 years on advanced kidney swaps that it's no longer required. So just think about how awesome the science is around that. This talk is really intended, especially for a lot of the people in the audience, and I can imagine a lot of you are relatively young, this is going to certainly add two years to your life if you think about things in terms of how this information is presented. And most likely, many of you, especially the younger people that are here from high school, many of you are going to live to well over 100 years old. And so what I want to talk to you about today is the link between artificial intelligence and a longer life. This is what I would refer to as the ultimate paradigm shift. And why is it the ultimate paradigm shift? If you think about it, what is more powerful to most people than living a longer, productive life? There is nothing more powerful. When I first got out of college, I went to work at New York Presbyterian Hospital. And there, two or three years before, the Shah of Iran had uh, stayed. And he had spent millions upon millions of dollars just to renovate a floor so he could receive his cancer treatment. And it dawned on me, there was nothing more important to him. And in spite of all the money he had, he wouldn't be able to expand the longevity uh, for his uh, life and his wellness. Setting that aside, it's going to be a one trillion dollar industry by 2030. So you just imagine how powerful that is. Um, what, what's driving this thing to make you be able to live beyond 100? The first is genome science. We all know uh, the challenges associated with the human genome. We all know about the advances that have occurred. Second is big data, and big data is around the data that you collect about individuals. And third is all of the devices that you can use today from a wearable standpoint to track this information in real time dynamically. What I'm going to talk to you about is how that intersects with artificial intelligence 
And there are big companies that are focused on providing this information now, right? If you think about Alphabet, many of you know the, the parent company of Google, Novartis, Illumina, these are companies that are bringing this technology to the cusp of enormous, unprecedented increase in, uh, increases in wellness. And so a lot of stuff is being written now about how AI can become the type of breakthrough that scientists have developed to add 20 years on average to your life expectancy. Uh, there's a lot of research uh, associated with that. And what's interesting about the research is that people who live past 100 get sick much later in life and for a shorter period of time. So what do we do to create technology to understand how to solve for that based on the realization of people living uh, longer lives? The first is find out their secrets and then develop drugs that mimic the ability for them to respond better uh, over life and then deliver that to the rest of us. The second is sort data. Now, machine learning is the kind of thing where you take data, you put it in a machine, the machine learns, you train it, you look at it, you do what's called backward propagation, you look at the back uh, results of the data, you see where you went wrong. But what they're suggesting today is to use machine learning to sit with scientists to work together hand in hand to innovate and replicate as long as the machines are running. Uh, third is to look at the similarities in terms of DNA of those that live longer and then obviously devise a plan for how you can identify and block a molecular pathway. Um, scientists have built a number of AI models uh, to analyze data. Now, one of the challenges of data and the analysis of data is the HIPAA regulations. We all know about that. But they actually have built some very advanced technology to be able to assess an individual from the time they're born and then assess what are the risks of them dying young. So, for example, the University of Nottingham is doing a lot of work in that area. And what they've realized is by doing this kind of math, medical knowledge will double, will double every 73 days by 2020 as compared to every three and a half years in the past. The second is, as I mentioned earlier, this genomic sequencing has come down so dramatically in price that the abilities that afford you the opportunity to do something genetically is, is, is much faster approaching. What we found from an artificial intelligence perspective is this notion of IQ. Why is it a challenge? They have done a number of studies and they have been able to correlate IQ with longevity. And so that is now a big part of what's coming out in what they refer to as cognitive epidemiology. Uh, there is obviously, a, the, the research is clear, there's a strong link to IQ. And, and, it's, and, and it's proven with an IQ of 100, just 15 points. They did this test, and what they did was the biggest form of backward propagation you could imagine. They started with students in 1932, they administered an IQ test to them, and they basically waited for them to get old. And once they realized that they got old, they looked at the people with the 15-point IQ advantage, and they realized that that was a 21% greater chance of that person surviving. Now, the real question is, what does that mean, right? What does that mean? Is that basically that people are smart enough to recognize that if they exercise and don't smoke and wear a seatbelt, that 15 points correlates to a longer life? Or is it based on what I was referring to earlier in terms of this uh, genetic uh, propensity? And these people in the space of epidemiological research are really coming up with those answers. And so, you know, there's many studies of people, it's like common sense, right? You, some group of people who live in Greece or live in Italy, the average age is a lot higher than normal. It's based on a Mediterranean diet. We kind of get that, you know, we understand that if you smoke, you have a higher risk of, of death. 
and you want to kind of make sure you don't smoke, and, and these are pretty simple things. But the thing about IQ, and, and, and what my company focuses on is partially on IQ, is that it raises enormous ethical standards and can really generate significant social injustice. I mean, if you think this is the absolute paradigm shift, if you think that the richest people in the world are gonna wanna live longer, what kind of ethical challenges does that deliver, right? Um, it's gonna be extremely expensive at first. I mean, if you think about uh, universal health care, whatever side of the political uh, equation you're on, if you think about uh, health care, think about what it would mean to somebody to be able to add years to their life and what that would pay for that. And so these disparities are going to continue to be a big challenge. So I refer to it as inequality and mortality. And some of the dilemmas are really, really challenging dilemmas, right? So for example, are we committed to extending life indefinitely if we can? Uh, what are we, how are we committed to life-saving? Will everyone have an equal chance? Uh, there's an enormous number of questions that, are, that arise. Uh, is the loss of a child and the passing of an elderly person the same thing? So just imagine how challenging this is gonna be uh, to get your hands wrapped around. The biggest opportunity here is to educate the public that IQ, for example, predicts outcomes of mortality to a certain extent, but it's not a destiny, it's not the panacea. And also understand what IQ means, right? We have one kind of way of thinking about IQ, but there's also ethical IQ, and that's an approach to dealing with issues and developing uh, studies on intelligence that may not have to do with the traditional way that somebody takes an IQ test from a pattern perspective, meaning by my company works uh, by building a bunch of artificial intelligence models that are culture fair, and really what culture fair is an equivalent to wisdom, right? You can see see somebody older and you say, wow, they're really smart. It may not be in the traditional sense that you think, but that wisdom provides insights. And by the way, that wisdom provides insights that transcend language, right? A lot of times people fail IQ tests because of the language barrier. So when you're thinking about a world of 122 year olds, there's enormous promise associated with the change in these lifespans. Now think about this statistic. If you, if in the United States, we were able to cure cancer, cure cancer, the average life expectancy would increase by two and a half years. Yet, if we were to be able to focus on things like heart disease, stroke, and diabetes, these are things that we can control to a certain extent, life expectancy would increase by another 14 years. So you're thinking about 16 years. Of those 16 years that your life expectancy can increase, only two of those years are related to cancer. Obviously, when we're talking about ways to help yourself, there are things associated with caloric in, uh, restrictions, watching how much you eat. So for example, there's a recent study that said if uh, a rodent uh, were uh, reduced its number of calories, it could basically equate to the equivalent of a 90-year-old resembling today's 50-year-old. Um, if you think about it in those terms, if they were to apply this to humans, you're talking about an enormous expanse and increase in the uh, number of years that you can live. One of the challenges in healthcare is not to try to cure an individual disease, but think about a far greater impact overall on public health by focusing on aging research and applying common sense approaches tied to data. Now, when we, uh, we believe strongly that AI and research are joined hip and thigh. And, and what that basically means is the ability to calculate with math things like, what is your real age? There are two principal parts of artificial intelligence. The first is machine learning, and that's basically where you take data, you analyze the data, you learn from the data, you apply that learning, and the machine gets smarter. It's basically the equivalent of an exponential number of data scientists in a room crunching numbers and the second is a thing called natural language processing, a little less known, but it's basically taking the signals that human beings emit 
uh, video, audio, the way they speak, how they speak, and taking that information, turning that into an insight about that individual, and applying it to their wellness, to their meaningfulness in life, to their uh, capacity to do better in the world. So MeaningBot works on all of this. As you know, I mentioned earlier genomics. If you think about genomics, think about the fact that the cost uh, to sequence the genome was $100 million dollars. Uh, seven to 18 years ago, and it now costs a thousand dollars. So that's the intersection of math with uh, processing power. When you uh, consider that the most advanced AI models correctly identified the risk of 76% of patients dying prematurely by using AI versus prior methods of only 44%, that kind of gives you a sense for what the math is all about and how powerful that math is. So at MeaningBot, there are a lot of companies out there that do what we do, right? They do it slightly different. We use artificial intelligence to understand people's words, build models to help them understand themselves better, and apply that to their careers things related to making sure the data is transparent, making sure it's open, we want to share that data with everybody. But one thing I'd like to have you think about, when you go to a doctor, how often does the organization collect your words dynamically? If we were able to take the words that you use, process those words, it will give us enormous insights about who you are, what you're feeling, and we can apply that math via natural language processing to understanding exactly what's affecting you and apply that longitudinally. So, uh, in summary, right, follow the money. This is going to be an enormous change. It's going to create significant challenges for the world. Uh, AI is changing everything. This notion of amortality is something you're going to hear about, and bias is going to become a social crisis unless we acknowledge the importance of being fair and equitable to everyone. So I leave you with a quote, live as if you were to die tomorrow, learn as if you were to live forever. And this is the first time in history where there's uh, two things that intersect together and are not disparate thoughts. Give the gift of life. Thank you very much.